Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Tony T's Tune Talk, available on the Port Washington Public Library's YouTube channel. My name is Tony Chiguardo, and my topic for this week, I want to look at situations where uh, bands break up or make some changes, and multiple members of that band move on to start another band. It's happened a number of times in music history going back to the 60s and you know we're all familiar with uh, the idea of uh, a group breaking up or members going solo and things like that but this is a unique uh, and cool situation in rock and roll let's look at a few examples so I had to start because I am um, in the middle of uh, reading a book by uh, a certain guitar player so I had to start with Joey D and the Starlighters the Starlighters were were uh, a band formed 1960 by a fellow named uh, Joey D. Nicola, nice Irish boy, um, and uh, they were scooped up. They were playing in Lodi, New Jersey, at a club, and they were spotted by a talent agent. And they were brought over to this intimate venue on Forty Fifth Street in New York City called the Peppermint Lounge. And it was supposed to be a one-time weekend gig, but what happened was during their first appearance at the club, uh, there was a famous actress named Merle Oberon and um, Prince Sergei Oblinsky. And these two were captured dancing the night away to the sound of Joey D. Nicola's band, which was Joey D. and the Starlighters. Uh, so the next day it appears in all the news columns, you know, especially all the society columns and all of the, you know, hot things to do in New York columns. Next thing you know, uh, the next night it's barricades, mounted police officers, uh, and they're trying to keep the crowds in line. So, you know, line around the block going on to Broadway. And for months and months after this, you know, you have celebrity visitors showing up. Judy Garland, John Wayne, Jackie Kennedy, Nat King Cole, Shirley MacLaine, Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, Liberace, among those spotted in the... How could you not spot Liberace? Um, spotted in the crowd going to the Peppermint Lounge. So, um, Joey D and company became such a, a sensation that they um, were the house band at the Pep for over a year, and then they were rehired again. Joey D eventually co-wrote the song Peppermint Twist with a producer named Henry Glover as a tribute to the Peppermint Lounge, and that song went to number one on the U.S. charts early in 1962. A million copies sold got a gold record. By this time, he also had his contract with Roulette Records. But Starlighters were, you know, coming and going. It was a revolving door. You know, they weren't a set band. This wasn't the Beatles. This was whoever was going to back Joey D. So in 1964, um, the keyboardist from Westchester and the drummer from New Jersey were joined by this French-Canadian guitarist whose given name was Jean-Paul Gourley, who had come to New York to make it big. And Gourley had been in a major band up in Rochester, New York, and it actually played a, like stadiums in Puerto Rico with this band that he was with, with a, with a wild uh, promotion deal. And um, now they're playing at the Pep. And now there is some shady deals going on here and there at the Peppermint Lounge, random nights of gunfire, uh, and what uh, he referred to as some wise guy activity going on here and there. And these three really talented musicians are starting to A, realize that this is not the greatest situation in the world, and B, realizing that they're kind of disposable. You know, this revolving door, they could just as easily be in that door. And um, they also start to realize that playing with Joey D, while it's cool to be playing at this big club, is kind of like playing, a, it's a dead-end gig. Uh, especially now that musical styles were starting to change. It was 1964, the Beatles were, you know, already on the scene, and that peppermint twist vibe was starting to, to disappear a little bit. So knowing that they were, you know, could go at any time, they decided they may as well go themselves. So teaming up with one of Joey D's singer's brothers, Joey D had a singer in the band named David Brigatti, so teaming up with a fellow named Eddie Brigatti, Felix Cavalieri managed to talk Dino Dinelli and Gene Cornish, Jean-Paul Gaulli, 
uh, into becoming the Rascals. So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty cool because the, 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 my favorite thing about the story was that, um, that as they were breaking the news to Joey D that, that they were leaving en masse, uh, Joey D had an absolute fit and threw all kinds of obscenities at them and came out with that great, you'll never get a job in New York again, <laughs> you know. Um, so, uh, oh well. And if you probably asked any random 200 people on the street who Joey D was, you'd probably get a, who? You know, wasn't he my doorman at, you know, um, unless they happen to know the peppermint twist. Um, the Rascals, them I think you'd, you'd know about. So anyway, that was our splintering from Joey D and the Starlighters. So we go now to Cream and Blind Faith. Um, needless to say, the origin of Blind Faith lie in the breakup of the very first supergroup, which was Cream. Uh, in 1968, Cream was just this huge critical and commercial success. Sold millions of records within a couple of years and brought international fame to the group and each individual member, whether they really wanted it or not, um, or regardless of how insane they were, <clears throat> Ginger Baker. But um, despite that, the band just completely fell apart because of the in incredible animosity between Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker. I mean, these two guys really just absolutely hated one another. Anyway, uh, Eric Clapton had, had just grown so tired of mediating all of this ridiculousness. He'd also grown tired of kind of like playing sort of what was amounting to commercially driven blues music, and in his opinion. And he wanted to move forward with something new, a little more experimental. So they did the two shows, Royal Albert Hall, November of 1968, and bang, that's the goodbye cream. Or farewell cream. Um, meanwhile, Steve Winwood had faced similar problems to Clapton during his time in the Spencer Davis group, where he had been lead singer for, for three years. Winwood wanted to experiment with the band's sound and wanted to infuse jazz elements into what they were doing, but there was too much conflict uh, musically. He leaves, goes and forms Traffic. So while Traffic is on hiatus, Christmas 1968, Winwood starts to jam with his buddy Eric Clapton in Clapton's basement in Surrey. Clapton had a great time at the jam sessions, but was really hesitant to start a new group. This was definitely not something he was into. And of course, the music press got wind of the jam. They're now hoping that Clapton's going to form this new uber super group that's going to be even better and bigger than Cream. Now, this is the funny part. At one point, Clapton and Woodward were tossing around a plan to record an album with Duck Dunn and Al Jackson Jr., the rhythm section of Booker T and the MGs. That would have been mind-boggling. Anyway, early 1969, Clapton and Winwood moved over to, to um, Traffic's rehearsal space. And uh, wouldn't you know it, at Steve Winwood's invitation, in walks Ginger Baker one day to sit in with them. Um, and... It goes great, and the three of them are now seriously considering starting a group. But Clapton is feeling really jittery, really, really jittery, very nervous, because he had made a promise to Jack Bruce that if any combination of them were ever to play together, that it wouldn't be without the third. So he and Jack Bruce ended up having a little bit of, of a conflict after that, even though they always had stayed close for the most part. Um, also, it was now nine weeks after Cream's breakup, and here he was playing with a member of, of Cream again. Also, it was terrifying to, for Eric to go into another band where the individual members of the group were all coming in with these huge reputations ahead of them already. Winwood eventually talks him into finalizing Ginger Baker's inclusion in the band, saying that Baker's going to obviously strengthen the group's overall musicianship and telling him it would be hard to find an equally talented drummer. So Traffic goes on hold, and uh, Winwood tells Chris Wood and the drummer and one of the singers in Traffic, Jim Capaldi, that this new project is happening. Winwood later finds out that Eric Clapton would have much preferred having Jim Capaldi as the drummer in the band mm. than having uh, Ginger Baker. Mm. Anyway... Clapton and Winwood are managed by Robert Stigwood and Chris Blackwell, respectedly, so they agree they're going to co-manage the band. 
Can you smell trouble coming? This starts immediate tension right away. Stigwood, being Robert Stigwood, wants a really quick money-making, come on, come on, let's make this happen, formula, baby. Let's just, you know, get out there, do some blues covers, do some, you guys are going to be great. The band wants to go and write songs and put together a strong record. Um, but Steve Winwood also said, you could smell that they wanted a super group. We didn't want a super group. We wanted a band. So um, finally, you know, formation of the band was announced on uh, February 8th, 1969. And by May, they pick up uh, Rick Gretsch, who was the bassist from a band called Family. He's invited to join them. And um, he leaves Family. And of course, now Family is honked off at everyone in, uh, in the new group. And they decide to name it Blind Faith because Eric Clapton uh, said that they were just going in this with this kind of self-belief that the band's going to be successful no matter what we do. And, of course, we all know when that album came out, uh, it, it topped the UK charts, topped the Billboard charts, sold more than half a million copies in the first month that it was out. And surprise, surprise, it also boosted the sales of all the early Kareem albums and the Traffic albums. So... From a commercial standpoint, um, Messrs. Blackwell and Stigwood were quite happy with the end result of all that. I go on to another, um, you know, this, this was a band that had more incarnations. Uh, it, the birds, when you look at the family tree, you laugh because the birds are their own family tree. You go through like six incarnations of the birds alone. Um, not to mention everyone who came off of it. But uh, what I didn't know was that the name the Flying Burrito Brothers uh, actually came from two guys who had been with Graham Parsons in the International Submarine, Submarine Band. Uh, two guys, Ian Dunlop and uh, Mickey Gauvin. And they formed the band, and uh, partly the, the name was something that had been half-jokingly suggested by Graham Parsons when they were talking about kind of like the uh, the country feel of it. And um, that band broke up, headed east, and basically left Graham Parsons the name. They said, well, you're doing something musically here. You take the name if you want it. Uh, so there was almo almost a completely different Flying Burrito Brothers, which was kind of kind of interesting. But um, anyway, with that original version of the band out of the picture, um, Flying Burrito Brothers, as we know them, came together in 1968 in L.A., put together by Graham Parsons and Chris Hillman. Uh, and uh, the bassist and keyboardist Chris Etheridge had played with Parsons in the International Submarine Band. And uh, the pedal steel guitarist named Sneaky Pete Kleinow, who was a brilliant, brilliant pedal steel player, uh, and the session drummer Fast Eddie Ho, who had played for everyone from uh, the birds to uh, to the monkeys, um, rounded out the lineup at the time. And interestingly, Chris Hillman, along with Roger McGuinn, had been one of the guys who fired Graham Parsons from the birds in July of 1968. But um, Hillman and Parsons reconciled later that year after Hillman who would switch from bass to rhythm guitar in this new ensemble, quit the birds. The story had gone that uh, Graham Parsons had refused to join the birds for a tour of South Africa, um, citing his disapproval of apartheid, and did not want to um, be part of that tour. But Chris Hellman actually doubted that that, that was the sincere right reason why he wanted to quit, because at the time, uh, Graham Parsons was hanging out with the Stones in London, and he had befriended them, but everything, you know, was a little murky. So Chris Hillman was like, yeah, you really don't want to go to South Africa, but you're also palling around with the Stones. When Hillman left the birds, the two of them straightened out all their personal stuff, and the new adventure started. So Flying Burrito Brothers went and recorded their debut record, which was the Gilded Palace of, of Sin, uh, without a regular drummer. Eddie Ho had been performing erratically with them because he was uh, building a, a raging substance abuse problem. So he had been dismissed after they only recorded a couple of songs. Um, and the group brought a bunch of session players in. 
Amazingly, before commencing on their first tour, they ultimately settled on a drummer. Michael Clark, the original drummer from The Birds. Why not? Um, Clark had been uh, working with a band called the Dillard and Clark Expedition, and uh, he came on board with the Burritos. So, uh, and he stayed their drummer through to 1971. So, Gilded Palace of Sin was, was critically acclaimed, and it was, you know, this incredible amalgamation of country and soul and psychedelic folk, and it's, it's just a really tremendous record, which only managed to peak at number 164 in Billboard. Mm. Goes to show you that, you know, sometimes these records are a little bit ahead of their time. Um, you know, I, we, we always joke about the idea that the Velvet Underground sold less than a thousand copies of their first album, but the joke is that everyone bought one, who bought one went out and formed a band. But anyway, um, Flying Burritos declined their invitation to perform at Woodstock, uh, um, and they embarked on a train tour of the United States because Graham Parsons was terrified of flying. Um, ultimately, that whole tour fell apart due to everyone's mounting drug and alcohol problems. Uh, Chris Etheridge would be replaced in 1969 um, by Bernie Ledden, another great player. And those guys, that incarnation of the band, would play at the Altamont Free Festival in December of 1969. You don't hear much about them in the documentary in Gimme Shelter because everyone was peaceful during their performance. So, you know, you have a nice, happy, peaceful performance and you don't get much time in that film. You know, after that, when all hell breaks loose, you know, that's all covered well. And that concludes this episode of Tony T's Toon Talk. Uh, please be sure to visit the Port Washington Public Library YouTube channel and check out some of the other great programming that we have available. Thanks for watching. Happy listening.